Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of the Influential Motherhood Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Duncan, and as a mom and lawyer, I want to be a cheerleader for moms who don't want to give up their own goals and dreams. Around here, we celebrate moms who are making a difference and talk about ways to juggle work, motherhood, goals, faith, self-care, and more. I'm so glad you're here. The only filters we use around here are coffee filters, so pour yourself a cup and enjoy the show. On today's episode of Influential Motherhood, I'm really excited to be here with a colleague of mine who has a really, really cool side hustle. Um, So I'm here with Brooke Buffington. Hello, Brooke. Thanks for being here. Hello. And I hope I don't call you Brooks because (laughs) my son's name is Brooks and it is what like rolls right off my tongue. So I'll answer to either. (laughs) Yeah. If for some reason I'm like, well, Brooks, um, don't take that personally. It's just because I I say it, you know, 700,000 times a day. Um, I totally understand. (laughs) I do know your name. I promise. (laughs) Um, But uh, Brooke, Brooke is a mom and a wife, and she works full-time in career services, um, the same industry that I'm in. And um, I learned a couple years ago that her side hobby and her side hustle is being a screenwriter and movie producer. And this story has always fascinated me, Brooke, just to (laughs) like, because when I heard it, I was like, oh my gosh, that is awesome. You know, I mean, for a lot of us, we're like, oh, well, I, you know, I knit or, (laughs) um, you know, I like, you know, run or whatever. But you're like, no, I write movies. I write Um, movies. I write movies. So we're going to chat about how this all came to be and how this journey has just kind of been laid out for you. Um, it sounds like through having faith and, yes. um, and listening to what God is kind of putting in front of you. And I'm really excited to chat about it. So absolutely. Um, even when it's terrifying. Yes. Even when it's <laughs> terrifying, those are the best, best kinds of faith moments. So, yeah. um, why don't you kind of tell us, I just gave the very brief introduction. So tell us a little bit more about you kind of what, what gets you up and going in the morning and, um, a little bit more about your family and and then we'll start talking about about writing movies and being in career services sure. and being a mom. Absolutely. So I work in career services, uh, like you said, and I've come to realize in the tenure of my career that I'm a storyteller. And I mm-hmm. think I've come into career services because I like stories. I like to hear students' stories. I like to hear where they're going or where they want to be. And so I naturally gravitate towards any type of career, any type of uh, opportunity where there's a story involved. So this story actually probably starts when I was in college. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'll get to that in a second. But I am the mother of a seven-year-old daughter. Um, She is our only child. And um, I have a wonderful partner in life, um, my husband, who um, puts up with my many, many, many storytelling times where I'm (laughs) kind of fleshing out a new movie or fleshing out a new TV show where I put the television on mute and I'm like, what do you think about this? Or what if I made this happen? And he um, is absolutely patient and listening through all of them and and is one of my best critics and one of my best supporters in uh, the journey of writing as well. So um, he'll tell me if it's a terrible idea um, and he'll also tell me if it's a great one. So uh, I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yep, he does. So yeah, so I'm um, I'm a full time um, professional. I'm a mother. I'm obviously a spouse, and um, I'm a, I have a side hustle. I'm a movie producer and, and a screenwriter, which is very much a part of my soul and who I am. So um, I can tell wow. you how that all started. Um, yeah. So take us. You said the story take starts us in back. College. It started in college. So yeah. Take us so to college. I, uh, in college, I was a junior in college, and my writing partner is uh, and she'll tell this great story. Um, but my writing partner, I met my writing partner when I was a junior in college. We did gymnastics together at UNC. And she tells this great story about how she was on her recruiting trip because um, she's three years younger than me. And our coach uh, picked her up at the airport and he, and he had her in the car. And he was telling her all about this gymnast that she needed to meet, one of, that was going to be one of her teammates. And, and he just kept talking and talking and talking about this girl named Brooke. And she says by the time she got to campus, she was so tired of hearing about this girl that she didn't want to meet her. She was like, I was just done. <laughs> I'd heard enough about her. I didn't want to meet she her. She felt like she knew you probably at that point. <laughs> she was so sick and tired of hearing about her. And he looked at her and he said, you guys are going to be best friends. Um, and we were. Oh uh, so she came in my senior year of college. She was a first year student. And we instantly hit it off. And we became like as close as sisters. Um, and we became best friends. And I graduated and went on in life. And then she graduated years later and did Teach for America. 
we kind of lost touch for about five years in there and then got back together when I was in graduate school, essentially kind of touched base again and, and reignited our friendship. And while I was in graduate school, she was an actress out in L.A. She was in a movie called um, Stick It, which mm -hmm. was a gymnastics Disney yeah. movie with Jeff Bridges, a fun uh, girl power movie. Love and it. she yeah. called me because she was a youth leader at a middle school at the time. And she called me and she said, Brooke, she said, I have a problem. And I said, what's your problem? And she was like, I'm a middle school youth leader and I'm auditioning for all these roles and all these parts and I can't play them because the content of what I'm auditioning for and the content that they're asking me to do as an actress doesn't align with my values and doesn't align with what I'm telling these young mm, people. Yeah. And I just, I can't do it. I, I want to work. I want to be an actress. I want to work in this industry because it's what I love to do and what I'm being called to do, but I can't do it in this capacity. She said, I'm thinking about writing a screenplay. And at the time I was in graduate school and all I was reading was academic material and I was so tired of academic material because I'd stopped reading anything for pleasure, which I'd love to do. Um, any novels and stories, like I said, I said, I will help you. I just wanted to dive back into a story. I was so excited to hear about anything that wasn't academic. Uh, I said, I'll help you. And she said, okay. I said, do you know how to write, you know how to write a screenplay? And she said, no. <laughs> um, and similar to what you're talking about with your podcast, she said, but we'll figure it out. Yeah. And so we wrote the screenplay for the movie that we ended up making called Chalk It Up easily 10 years before we actually made the movie. So oh, it was our wow. okay. first screenplay and it was awful. It was awful. It was terrible. Um, and we have, I think, 23 iterations of it to get uh -huh. to the screenplay that we ended up actually making. So it started in college when we met. Um, it We started writing in graduate school and then we built over 10 years our writing skills. We came to understand how to write a screenplay, the, the what makes a movie a wonderful movie. And that led us to finally making Chalk It Up. I love this. Okay, so we're going to break all this down. Mm -hmm. So uh, she said, do you know how to write a screenplay? And you're like, no, yes. but I'm in because I, <laughs> I love stories. Yes. And what, remind me what you were in grad school for. I was in grad school like, for counseling. Your, yeah. Okay. So you were, you were, it was a, it was like a higher ed or counseling. Um, yeah. Counseling. Yeah. Okay. Master's in counseling. I'm actually a licensed therapist. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't know that I realized that. So, mm -hmm. so had you always liked, I mean, you always liked stories, but had you ever tried to like write a, you know, mm -hmm. a movie or a story or a book, you know, before then, or you were Never. just somebody who just took it in and... I'm a person who takes it in, so I, okay. I read everything that I can get my hands on. Doesn't matter um, the kind of type of novel, the type of book. I love children's books all the way through to classic literature. Mm -hmm. What's ironic about all of this is when I was in high school, my senior year, I was ahead on English, and so I joined a literary journal um, because I love to read and I love literature. And I quickly realized in writing for that literary journal that I was actually a pretty bad writer. I wasn't a great writer, um, especially <laughs> when <laughs> uh, they didn't publish any of my pieces. They kind of patted me on the back and it was very much like a good try type of support that I got, mm -hmm. but never. Um, so I never considered myself to be a writer. I never considered myself. I was a reader and I was, a, I was really good at deciphering um, context and, and literature. So I did really well in college in all my literature classes, but never in writing them. So what I found as a creator, and, and I think many of us are called to be creators in different fashions, um, you're creating a podcast, other people create visual art, photography, um, I create screenplays, movies, is that you have to find your medium. Yep. So if a, if a visual artist is, is sketching in pencil uh, and they're not meant to be a, a person who sketches in pencil and then finally some of them gives them a block of clay and they realize that they're a sculptor then they may have been a terrible artist at pencil. Um, yeah. and, but they finally get that block of clay in their hands and they're like, oh, this is where I was supposed to be the whole time. Yeah. So when Maddie said, let's write a screenplay, um, she sent me a sample of what they'd done for Stick It and, and I read it and so I understood the format of it and I said, oh, this is just a story. It's not the beautiful prose. It's not these well-configured sentences. It is the bare bones of a story and mm -hmm. I can tell a story. Um, so it was like... I'd found my medium. All of a sudden, this whole world of writing that had been very close to me since high school because I'd been told, you know, good try, uh, this yeah. isn't for you, opened up in a really big way just because somebody put the right medium in front of me. Oh, man. So, Did you have a moment where you thought, like, well, maybe counseling isn't the direction I need to go? Like, it, it, was it a, I mean, did you consider getting into any sort of formal training for screenwriting? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. I thought about it, um, but I am, and it goes with the chalk it up story, very much a person who likes security. Uh, yeah. I like to know kind of what the next step is. I like to have a very safe and stable job. Um, that's why I'm gifted um, and wonderfully blessed to have Maddie in my life because she is a person who full on will head on take a risk without even mm-hmm. looking back twice. And so we compliment each other in that where I'll be like, let's step back for a second and think about this. And she's like, no, we're going. And I kind of have to run to catch up. Um, so for me, the counseling track was the secure track. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. I love people. I love their stories. I love helping them unfold and figure out who they are. So it didn't disalign. Um, and the screenplay seemed like at the time very much a hobby, right? It was a, yeah. a fun hobby to do. It tapped into my creative energy. And so it seemed pretty harmless uh, at the time, which going into it, I never thought, never, ever thought that we would actually make something. It was, it was never that intention. It was was more for fun. Yeah. It was absolutely for fun for me. Yeah, Yeah. it absolutely was for fun for me. And then um, what happened was as we, we wrote Chalk It Up and then we continued to write because we enjoyed it. We eventually submitted something to a contest. I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, it was a... um, (laughs) A dark fairy tale story about um, a crime thriller type story about uh, Snow White, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty after they've gotten married to Prince Charming and they all realize they're married to the same man. So, oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> I love that. It's funny. Um, so it, it did really well in a big contest and we became finalists and all of a sudden people um, started to contact us and we realized, oh, we might not be bad at this, right? And I think that was yeah. the first time that we stepped back and said, oh, there's something here. Oh, that's awesome. So uh, when you were writing Chalk It Up, she was still in LA and you were still in North Carolina. So like just very practically, what does this look like? We get asked that question a lot. So we speak on the phone Mm -hmm. every single day. Um, And I think the biggest part of that is no matter if we only have two minutes or if we have an hour and a half, we pray together every single day. So she is my co-writer. She is my co-business owner. We own um, two businesses, two LLCs Mm -hmm. together, but she most importantly is my prayer partner. And so we pray together every single day on the phone. And it might, like I said, it only be 30 seconds where she calls and it's like, I've got 30 seconds, I'm on set and we'll say a prayer and that's it for the day. So uh, we talk every day. And then each one of us takes a lead on a project. So if I'm really passionate about this new television pilot we're writing, I'll take the lead on it and then toss it over to her. So right now we're writing a new pilot. Um, I write on it every night. I send it to her at night. She's three hours earlier. She reads it overnight. She writes in more scenes or writes in notes or changes things and will toss it back to me. And then I work on it the next day. So um, we literally just send a document. There's now much more technologically advanced ways to do this. We could just work off the same document, but we've become really accustomed to sending the document back and forth. And it gets to the point to where when we'll have a final um, script and we'll read it together out loud over the phone, I'll say, oh, that's a really good line you wrote. She's like, no, you wrote that. And I'm like, no, I I don't, I didn't write that. So we almost forget, right, who wrote what, because we've both been in it so much um, that it, we, we honestly will argue over like, that's, I didn't write it. Like, I don't oh, know who wrote awesome. it, but uh, it was written. So yeah, that's how we do it. That is so cool. So wh- where did motherhood fit, begin to come mm. into this journey for you? Because you're graduating from grad school and yes. you're starting to get into this, you know, quote unquote hobby <laughs> Yes, at the time. Yes. Um, and at some point, <laughs> motherhood entered the picture. So yeah. um, what was that like? What's crazy is that motherhood is actually the reason that we are able to produce the movie. And I didn't know that at the time either. So I, after graduate school, I went to work at an institution, working in career, which is what I do now at a different um, institution. And um, I started writing more and we started doing well in contests. And it was, once again, still more of a hobby. We would send scripts out to people, but never thought of actually making our own. Um, And then I became pregnant with our daughter. And I was a terrible writer during that time. I apologize <laughs> many, many times to Maddie. I said, I'm stupid right now. I'm just very, very stupid. Uh, <laughs> and tired. <laughs> and tired. As yeah. many mothers know, um, the brain cells tend to leave the body when um, you're building a baby. So uh, my brain cells definitely were not on full go mode during my pregnancy and even the first year after because of sleep deprivation. So um, 
but what happened was when our daughter turned one, um, and this is a God story too, our daughter turned one and she started to just be miserable when I was dropping her off at daycare. And I'd gone back to work pretty quickly after um, just due to working for the state in a large institution. We didn't get much time off. Um, and at one years old, it was horrible to drop her off. She was at a great daycare, but it just was miserable for me. It felt like every bone in my body was saying, don't leave her here. Mm -hmm. Um, and I started praying and I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I can't leave her. I can't, I can't do this anymore. And I walked into our house one afternoon after my husband had dropped her off at daycare that morning. And he said, you're not supposed to be at work. And I said, I know, I said, I know I'm supposed to be home. And so we made the decision that I was going to stay home with her from about one and a half to three years of age because I had the opportunity to work a part-time from a master's program virtually, uh, help teach some classes online. So I could still have some sort of income, but also have the chance to be with her. So Maddie, uh, being the wonderful person that she is who sees opportunity, said, if you're going to be home, she said, let's do a Kickstarter campaign for Chalk It Up, which is the movie that we made. Because she knew, and this is what she said, she said, because I'm going to be too old to play the lead part soon, because it was set in college, oh. and, <laughs> and, and let's at least give it a try. And, um, and like I said, I like safety and security, and I had no belief that we would ever make this movie. But Maddie is a force to be reckoned with, and she doesn't take no for an answer. And I said, sure, I'll set up a Kickstarter campaign. I've got some time on my hands. Lila and I were having a great time at home. Um, I was... Like at first when I left work, I was terrified. I'd worked my entire life. I remember I cried when I told my boss I was leaving to stay home with my daughter Mm -hmm. um, because I felt a sense of responsibility and a sense of obligation to being a professional. um, And it was hard to let go of that. So um, that transition, as many mothers who maybe have made that choice, isn't as seamless as it seems, right? Once I did it, it was great. But making that step was really scary. Um, so when I was home with Lila, Maddie said, let's do a Kickstarter campaign. Let's just try to raise the money and see what happens. Let's give it a shot. Mm -hmm. So we put a Kickstarter out there for a hundred thousand dollars. And I thought, there's no way, there's no way we're going to raise a hundred thousand dollars. That's crazy. We actually raised thirty thousand dollars, which was huge. Um, considering that we, you know, didn't know what we were doing. Um, and (laughs) I love that you're like, we just, we had no idea. (laughs) I knew how to do a Kickstarter. That's pretty, you know, they walk you through the process really easily. Yeah. Um, and then Maddie calls me one day and I'm home with Lila. We're probably on a walk because we used to go for like these nice two hour walks. Cause when you're a stay at home mom, you get to maybe sometimes go on these really long leisurely walks that you don't get to do when you're working all the time. Um, we're probably on a two hour walk looking at bugs and sticks and trees. And Maddie said, Somebody just called me from Canada. It's a family. His daughter's a gymnast, and they want to fund our entire movie. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And my reaction was, you said no, didn't you? And I said, we don't take money from people we don't know to do something we don't know how to do. (laughs) (laughs) And she said, I said, yes. Um, And I think at that moment, my blood ran cold. Um, It was just that moment of like, what are we what are we getting ourselves into because before that it had been like this pie in the sky you know sure we'll try to make a movie and it became a very real like it became a reality in yeah, front of like me we, ha- we have to make a movie now <laughs> we have to make a movie now um and that's where i tell anybody who might be more like me averse to risk a bit more on the safety side of things to surround yourself with people who are the opposite than you mm-hmm. because maddie didn't flinch she said, I said, yes. She said, we're making this movie. And I said, we don't know how to make a movie. She said, we'll figure it out. So <laughs> we were, uh, as you're probably familiar with, we got on the phone with lawyers. We were starting yep. to build an operating Good. agreement. <laughs> we, uh, we, we established our LLC so that my husband, who's nervous as I'll get out, was like, I don't want to be financially liable for this film. <laughs> um, and so we put everything into place. And then Maddie and I are looking at each other and we're like, how do we make a movie? So... One, we started praying, uh, and we prayed a lot because this money had literally fallen into our laps. So we knew it was what we were supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. it, it was very clear that this is what we were being called to do. Trust that you can do it, and then ask for help. Yeah. And so that's what we started to do. Everybody that Maddie knew out there in L.A. who had made any type of film, we started to ask for help. We humbled ourselves. We opened our hands, and we said, tell us what to do next. Um, and all of these amazing people 
just stepped up to the plate. Oh my goodness. Um, all of these amazing people. I mean, and it didn't, I mean, it did not happen without tears. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, we oh, built, sure. we built the props on my living room floor. Um, we went shopping for the wardrobe ourselves with oh uh, a girl that we knew that was really fashionable. We we're like, come with us, go shopping. You get to pick out some clothes. There in a movie. We essentially built it from the ground up. Um, we, you know, we hired every single person. Uh, we told them what we were doing. We told them the reason that we were doing it was that we wanted to make a movie that was clean, yeah. that was fun, that was entertaining, and that was good for young girls, seven to 17 years old. Um, and essentially, it's a Disney type movie, right? Yeah. With a very, good, very, though. very yeah, small good. budget, a much, much lower budget, budget than a Disney movie. Um, so we did. We started to build um, every single part of the movie and put it all together. And what, now looking back on it, is God put all these people into place who all were also striving to make feature films. So mm -hmm. what we found out after all of this is that our line producer, who was wonderful and a gift, um, came to us after the movie and she said, I'd never done a feature film before this. I didn't want to tell you guys. I'd done a bunch of short films. I'd done small films, but I'd never done a feature. This gave me the next step that I needed to now do much bigger films. Oh, and the that. same with our makeup um, girl. Our makeup girl had never been on a film before in this capacity. And now she's got this huge business that she owns and, and does great things and is sought after for her makeup work. Um, so all of these people were just at the cusp of their careers and yeah. different aspects of what they did for our film and being part of a very small budget, but a SAG film. It was a union film. It was on IMDb. Um, it, it got on Netflix. So it built their legitimacy to be able to then go on to do these uh, wonderful jobs that they were trying to do. So it ended up very much through a gift from God being like a blessing to everybody who was a part of it in a yeah. different way. That's just amazing how God weaves you know, like everybody together at the right place at the right time and then takes those and kind of like, unweave, you know, sends them off yep. into different pathways. That's just, yep. it's incredible to me. Um, yep. Oh man. So what you were still, when the movie was made, you were still at home with your daughter? I was still at home okay. during pre-production. So a movie, I don't know how many uh, of your listeners uh, know much about film producing, but a just movie assume, takes... assume we know nothing. We're, we we <laughs> so, know nothing. <laughs> um, Independent films, especially, take a really long time to make uh, because you you can either you either have speed and money, or mm -hmm. if you don't have money, you have to give them time. Because usually, if somebody's working for you, they're working for you on the weekends. They're doing kind of this is a side hustle for you because you're not paying them what their normal rate would be if they're yeah. working on a much bigger film or a part of their normal job. So in 2014, um, in no September. No, no, I'm trying to think. Let me go backwards. September of 2014, we shot our feature film in 12 days, which anybody who has ever made any type of film, that was insanity. Um, and But we had a really low budget. That's what we had to do. So we shot 100 uh, minutes of film. Um, I mean, many more minutes of that, but what ended up being 100 minutes of a film in 12 days, which is insane. Um, and it took an entire year to get to that process. So pre-production started in December of the year before. Um, and we pre-production is budgeting and building your crew and building your cast and figuring out where am I going to shoot this film? Um, essentially, what's going to be the cheapest place for me to do this? What are the locations that I need? Um, how many props do I need? You know, Who's going to design the set? And how much are we willing to pay for XYZ? It's all of these pre-production things. It's essentially project management uh, that you have to put into place to then focus all your time and effort on 12 days of filming. And what I will tell you, um, at least our experience was, we knew that this was something that we were being called to do. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean I wasn't terrified. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that at times I called Maddie and I said, what are we doing? Um, and she was like, we're going to be okay. Um, and there wasn't <laughs> times where um, things just seemed completely beyond our capabilities. Yeah. Um, and during those 12 days of filming, it was probably some of the hardest days of my life um, Why is because that? everything went wrong. Oh, really? Everything went wrong. If you could figure out something to go wrong, it went wrong. So I woke up every morning terrified about what problem was going to happen that day. Oh, yeah. um, and I stayed home. So, so the crazy part of this was is I only had, you know, Lila was only two years old and I wasn't ready to leave her for 12 days. Um, in a stretch. And so I stayed home and managed the 
kind of the logistics, the project management side of this from home while Maddie was out in LA shooting the film. And so I was managing it all via phone um, on a three hour time difference. Um, and so when something went erupt, for example, there we were supposed to shoot at an office location and that office called us last minute and said, we've got a client coming in today, you can't shoot here. And I've got 15 people that are ready to start filming um, a scene that you're paying easily $2,500 a day to have all those people employed and all the equipment and you're, they're just, they've got nowhere to go. <laughs> Oh my gosh. It's just money, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you, and it's somebody else's money, which is the yeah. terrifying part of me. If it's yeah. my money that I'm losing, I, I'm okay, like, I'm not okay, but I, I feel better about it. But if somebody else's money I'm losing, I feel such a sense oh of obligation towards them. Um, and, and so every night I would lay on the floor. I remember vividly, and Maddie can attest to this, I would lay on the floor after they were done filming. And I would probably usually cry. And I would say, never make me do this again. <laughs> <laughs> Hey friends, popping into this fun episode to remind you to take a quick second to subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. And don't forget, you can also sign up for bonus episodes and content from my monthly newsletter at melissaduncan.com slash join. Thanks for listening and let's get back to the show. Yeah, I was going to I was going to actually <laughs> ask you like what were you saying to God after following, you know, what yeah. felt like, you know, just a matter of faith and a faith journey and oh. you know, listening to God to get to this point and then it's all falling apart. Well, oh, what gosh. was your conversation with God at that point? We I you know, we never doubted that he wanted us to do it. But he never told us it was going to be easy. Yeah. Yeah. So what I would say our conversation with him at that point was we have to, or his conversation back to us more so, because I just cried and I was like, we, I mean, and we figured out every problem and every problem he presented a solution, but in the moment it felt so overwhelming, right? Yeah. Every time we had a problem that felt like there was, there was nowhere to go, there was always a solution that we found through the mix. But essentially what he was telling was him, what us through it was rely on him more rely on ourselves less. Mm, um, and yeah. that's been a recent mantra that I've been trying to embody is mm -hmm. uh, less of me, more of you. Yep. Um, in my daily living, right? Uh, we tend to, uh, pride can get the best of me sometimes. Mm -hmm. I can focus on my dreams of screenwriting and making grand movies that make people happy. Um, but it's all about him. And yeah. what does he need me to utilize his talent for? And what does he need me to write? And what does he need me to focus on? So through that process, he was saying, trust in me, less of you, more of me, and it will be okay. And yeah. so what we started doing, you know, Maddie and I together had prayed over this film every morning before set. She called me on the way to the set and she, we prayed. And every night we, you know, ruminated over the terrible happenings of the day and we prayed. <laughs> um, but what we started doing and what she started doing was she started praying on set. She would bring, and our cast was not a completely Christian cast. It was very mixed. It was, um, but she just pulled together whoever wanted to be there and they held hands and she prayed over every set. Oh, I love that. And she, she just, I mean, turned it all over. She was like, yeah. and as soon as we started to do that, as soon as we started to turn over everything saying, we don't know, we've, we've, we can't do it anymore on our own. And, and we've been trying to do that. We try to grab things back, right? We always are pulling it back. Like I got it now. Thanks for offering yeah. me this opportunity, but I got it now. I'm going to go run with it. Um, but as soon as we started praying on set and as soon as we started to turn more over, it all started to fall back into place. Oh, wow. Um, so that's I what we did. That. We just started praying more. We just, I yeah. mean, every, she would call me and say, I can't, you know, nobody's here yet, but I'm on set and we would pray. I mean, there was probably 12, 15 times a day that we just out loud we're praying and now because maddie and i've been praying together over the phone for 10 years i mean i pray in walmart and target you know if we're yeah. on the phone and we've got two minutes we're, i mean there's many people in our town who've heard me praying i it's a very comfortable thing for me mm -hmm. um and uh, a very common thing for me so i don't think anything of it now so maddie was that same place she was like anybody who comes in we're praying like this is what we're doing um and that's what we did so that's how we combated Every obstacle on the tail end of that movie was just through prayer. That's beautiful. That's and that's mm -hmm. what he wants us to do. You know, is to come to him with, with our needs and yeah. Uh, look at and look we, what a difference that made. Yeah, wow. and the one thing we knew every night, and the one thing we prayed every night was that our God is more powerful 
than any problem that can encounter yes. and set. Yes. And that's the one thing we rested in. Like, that's the one thing, even through all those obstacles, even when I was laying on the floor crying, I knew that we were going to win yep. and that he was going to win. Like he, he, it didn't matter how many things were thrown at us. He was going to prevail yeah. in all of that. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's yeah. What an amazing story. So um, it's, I want to stop for a second and like, this is a hard pivot away from the prayer conversation. Yeah. So sorry, but um, you were talking about making this movie in 12 days. So I, I actually have do, I, I have one experience with making a, with uh, not. Oh, do you? Me. Yes. So here we go. I'm going to lay it out there. This is my, um, what I like to, you know, in a job interview, if they're like, what's something interesting that's not on your resume? Here it is. When the movie Leatherheads came to Greensboro to be filmed, this is the one with George Clooney about a football, yes. football team back in the 20s. Absolutely. Um, John I, Krasinski. Yes. Yep. John Krasinski. I signed up to be an extra. <laughs> and so I got picked. And I don't know that there was any criteria other than, like, you have a pulse. Um, and so, <laughs> <laughs> like, there, you know, no talent required. It was basically, like, you're breathing and alive. Come here. And they actually <laughs> – so, I mean, you know, my hair is blonde and not as long as it used to be, but it's past my shoulders. And I so I show up for filming day at this costume place and they, it was like off in some in Winston-Salem in some like factory and they were like um we need you to cut your hair like super oh, no. super 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 <gasps> short and I just like stared at the woman and I just shook my head no I was like I'm sorry but if I have to cut my hair I'm leaving <laughs> like it's not worth it <laughs> and I am not that committed to being an extra in this movie and um, oh my goodness I was in law school at the time and it was just one of those things like I need something different to do <laughs> for a day kind of thing yep. and so yeah um so whatever fantastic they, I know so they they actually let me stay and and said well if we can get it all up and put it in a wig or whatever in a hat or a wig, in a hat mm -hmm. or wig then you're okay and so I was like fine it's a deal but I'm not cutting my hair so we go out to um someplace in downtown Greensboro to film this movie and I swear to you it had to look like it was raining and first George Clooney said there was too much it was too wet and then it was <laughs> like not wet enough and then so we would you know they would get out these big hoses and like spray down all the old cars and the scene was um outside of the war memorial stadium and we were yes. like walking in it was like the crowd for the game was walking in and so we were all standing around in our you know 1920s get up like you know these odd hats and jackets and um you walked like six feet, you know, over and mm -hmm. over again, but they yep. would get these huge hoses and spray down all the cars because it needed to look like it had just rained. And yep. like I said, you know, George Clooney's walking around and he's like, too wet, too wet. So then we had to wait for it to dry. Well, then we waited too long. And so then it was too dry. And so then we had to wet it a little bit again. It's so like, I mean, it I spent, takes forever. I, I spent an entire like 12 hour day stand like walking six feet over and over again yes. and uh -huh. and then the one i have watched that, that movie eight I don't, seconds. it's not in there i can't find it <laughs> <laughs> so my uncle actually texted me not too long ago he's like i'm about to watch leatherheads where's your scene and i was like you know like don't blink because um <laughs> i haven't found it yet and so if you blink you might if it's in there, you're going to miss it. <laughs> so, yep. um, when you say 12 days, I'm like, oh my gosh, because that movie yeah. we spent, and we spent 12 hours yep. just doing what was at best a half a second in the, in the yep. movie. So, Do you know um, what's the crazy part of that in God's what? sense of humor? I was there too. You were? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Stop. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. I was in graduate school at the time, um, locally in uh, Winston-Salem, and I had seen the call for extras, and oh I thought, gosh. just like you, that sounds like a fun day. I'll go do it. And I had the same encounter except with my hair, because they didn't want anybody with highlighted hair to be in the picture, because people didn't highlight their right. hair in the 20s, right? So I have beautiful blonde highlights that kind of sort of match the color I used to have when I was young. And so they threw all of my hair up in a hat is yep. what they did. I think so I was in a hat. hat. Yep. Oh, that I was in the hilarious. same exact scene. Same exact scene. Well, is it in the movie? No. Have you found no. it? No. No, I don't know. No, I've never it. seen it. <laughs> Me either. That is hilarious. So you know, we were like walking six feet. Nope. Do it yes. again. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Oh, that is hilarious. Me. 
Isn't oh that so gosh. funny? It is that funny. Is... That is hilarious. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that was my one and only movie debut experience. <laughs> well, that's why I never, that that was my, I've been on, on movie uh, sets since then with Maddie and other things, but um, that was definitely my introduction to what movies are, which is a very inefficient process. <laughs> yes, I know. Well, yeah, I mean, you were there like this whole like hosing down the yeah. cars and then to what? Uh, oh and, gosh. Uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> yep. Oh yep. man. Um, so, so you went back to work. We're going yeah, we to back to work and you now, yep. ha you now have a job, a kid, and your movie. And, and post-production of a movie. Post so at this point, yeah. um, the post-production process, um, I it took a year in pre-production. It took 12 days to film that beautiful, beautiful movie. And then um, we were in post-production when I went back to work. So she turned three years old. Uh, we moved to North Carolina. Uh, it was time to kind of put her back in school, get her acclimated to the school environment, and for me to go back to work. And we had an almost completed movie. Um, and we're sitting here proudly, I will say, mm -hmm. with this almost completed movie. We had a cut. We had some music. We had, you know, there's a lot of technical things that go on the back end of a movie, such as color correction and all different types of, of sound correction that happens. Um, but we were really proud of ourselves. So, you know, we looked at this whole thing and we said, you know, God made this happen. This is a, a great movie. We, we did it. Now what? Right? Uh, yep. like, yeah. What, what do we do now? What, what's next? Uh, <laughs> here it is. Like, somebody do something with it. So, um, once again, we, we prayed and we went around to people and we said, we don't know what's next. What do we do next? Um, I think a part of this process for anybody who's starting a new is to ask questions and mm -hmm. say, I don't know. Be willing to say, I don't know. Help me, please. Um, and we did that and we were very uh, gracious when anybody was willing to help us. Um, so we did. We said, I don't know, help us please. And people walked us through the process. We found um, a distributor, which is Gravitas Ventures. You guys might see their name pop up on Netflix every once in a while. And mm -hmm. um, the funniest part of all this is Gravitas said, we'll try to distribute the film. We'll get it for 10 years. So they have rights to distribute the film wherever they want for 10 years. Um, and they called us one day and said, um, Netflix would like to pick up your movie. And I think at that moment, Maddie and I both, our jaws much of, hit the floor. And then they <laughs> told us the, the, the uh, licensing fee that they wanted to pay, which was, which was essentially equivalent to the movie's budget. And I thought at the moment they were saying they want you to pay them this much money. Yeah, that's what to, I was going to ask. So that to, means yeah. they pay you, right? Is <laughs> that what that means? But I didn't understand that at the time because okay. all we'd done was paid money and paid money and paid <laughs> money like, to make I this don't movie. Have that. <laughs> that's exactly what I said. I said, no, 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 no. We can't give the movie to Netflix. We don't have any more money. And he said, no, they want to pay you that money to play your movie for two years, to license it domestically for two years. And we just, I don't even think we said anything. I think our distributor was like, are, are you guys still there? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Oh so, and I think it's because they, they needed family-friendly fare. They needed family-friendly yeah. movies out there. They needed something that we, as, you know, young girls watched growing up, they, you know, there's no TGIF anymore, right? So yeah. there's not that type of really easy um, to watch. I don't have to worry as a parent about watching over their shoulder to explain something at any given moment um, type of a film that's out there. And this one's set in college, but it stays away from most of the more kind of edgy college things. And it has a very sweet kiss at the end. You know, it, it, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, it doesn't push any limits as far as yeah. um, the environment that they're in is concerned. Um, and so they picked it up. They picked it up for two years. It was licensed domestically. And, and then our distributor said, if it does well domestically, they'll license it for international. And we thought, oh, oh that's wow. a, that would be, you know, that's probably a long shot, but thank you for telling us about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so in September, it released on Netflix and it was, it was just a gift. It was a blessing. And it was a really neat day for us because, yeah. um, one, right before it released in September, Maddie flew back to North Carolina and we had our first screening for the film at um, the Varsity Theater in Chapel Hill where we'd met mm -hmm. and where we'd gone to school together and where we'd done gymnastics together. And we invited all of the gymnasts in the local gyms in the oh, area to come. Fun. And it was free for them to come. And we got to screen our movie um, at our university where it had all started. Yeah. So that was really, really neat um, blessing to be able to do. And then to see it launch on Netflix. 
um, was just unbelievable. So oh, that's incredible. Um, and we emailed once again all the it's a, it's a gymnastics film, so we emailed all of our contacts within the gymnastics world and said, watch this movie on Netflix. Even if you don't really like it, just put it on mute and have it playing on your <laughs> television. Go make dinner. <laughs> Um, and that's what my father did. My father, my dad, who's and my mom, who are wonderful, said, "We've had it on all day, Brooke. It's just on mute. <laughs> <I love laughs> we just that. keep watching it over and over and over." And um, so it released in September, and then our distributor called us in October and said they want to release it or they want to license it internationally in November. Oh my gosh. Um, after so a they, month, after a month, they oh picked it up gosh. international. Yep, and then. Um, so it went international and we would get the reports. We get a quarterly report saying where it's being watched and it's being watched all over the world. Um, this little tiny movie uh, that uh, we... Did you just pinch yourself? Like this is uh, insane. It's crazy. Kind of it's yeah. insane. And then Maddie's friend, a couple, uh, I guess about two years ago, texted her on an airline and she was like, I'm watching your movie on an airplane. And we're like, oh what? My gosh. <laughs> are, you, are you watching our movie on an airplane? Um, so apparently Qantas Airlines had picked it up. And so it... It just shows the power of what God can do yep. um, when we give him the chance to do it. Oh. Um, and I have to remind myself of that because I'm a control mother. You know, I'm a mother, right? I'm a mother. Yep. I'm a working professional. And so I like to have things under control and I like to keep things in control. Um, and oftentimes God asks us to turn that control over. And I have a really hard time with that. Yeah. Um, and this is one thing that we turned over and look what he did, you know? Mm. Um, I love I tr- this story. Yeah. This yeah. Is so I try to tell myself that when I'm holding like tight to something and trying to fix it myself or holding tight and trying to do it myself of like, well, you know, if you release control, like think how much better God can do than yeah. you could ever do with this. Right. Yeah. Um, he knows so much more than we do about oh gosh what we can do and where you know where things no what what can I think point others to him you know yes. like I mean just the fact that like that phone call started and now um, yep th- there's this you know you have this story to tell and she has the story to tell mm-hmm. and you're making a movie that like you said you know parents feel like they can put their kids in front of and it not be like oh you know, this is, this is not what I thought yep. it was. <laughs> yeah, kind of yep, exactly. Um, I mean, we yep. were watching America's Got Talent the other night and we were, we were like, oh my God, goodness, this is not what we, you know, thought of. Like, what, <laughs> and I even said to, to Damon, I was like, what time does this, because we watched it on like yeah. on a recording. And I said, what time does this normally come on? Because I thought like families are sitting in front of the TV watching yeah. this with their kids. Um, I was just kind of shocked. What is your, so uh, you, one conversation that you and I had, um, when we ran into each other a couple of weeks ago, I said, so when do you work on your, your screenwriting? Yes. And you said at night and I was like, Oh good. Cause that's when I, <laughs> that's when I podcast. <laughs> um, but you know, I, one thing I'm sensitive to with podcasting is it can, because I work very full time as you mm-hmm. do as well, um, that it can fill every corner that I let it in, um, in terms like, po- you know, podcasting can in terms of any extra yep. time I have, like it will take up as much time as I allow it to. And I think when you're really excited about something, and I think prob- I would guess for you having someone who's relying on, on you, you know, on the other side of the country, <laughs> um, I, I am still kind of learning the balance between, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, my kids are in bed. Um, I need, I feel like I need to jump into this and work on it, but I also want, you know, I want to spend time with my husband and, um, I think it's easy to just be like, I'm just going to go work on this an hour. And then that turns Mm -hmm. into two hours or three. So how have you found that balance in, you know, your marriage and, um, like what has been your husband's role? I mean, it sounds like he's a great cheerleader for you, but that's something that, you know, I'm I'm still trying to figure out like how to, how to be sure I'm having appropriate podcasting yep. boundaries at night yeah he can I mean he's a wonderful supporter but he can get tired um when I when I one just need to pitch stories to him for hours on end where I'm coming up <laughs> with new ideas or when I just am so embedded in a story where he's like are you even there you know um yep. so we have those moments where he'll check in with me and say you've written every night for the last you know four or five nights I don't think you need to write tonight um yeah. where you know as a as a wife trying to gauge Kind of if he's busy working, I always will take it. He's got some things that he needs to get done. I always take those opportunities to say, okay, you've got some things to do tonight. I'm going to write. Mm-hmm. Um, but if he's not busy or neither one of us have work to do, making sure that I designate and set aside that time to hang out and to talk yeah. and to watch a movie. Um, 
and um, he goes to bed a little bit earlier than I do, and he will, he'll tell you. He was like, I don't remember the last time I actually went, fell asleep or went to bed at the same time as my wife. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so I try to make sure there's a couple of nights a week that I do go to the bed as, at the same time as him, um, but I do. I stay up later. I, don't, I need less sleep as a, mm-hmm. as a person. I think as a mother, we learn to survive on less sleep yep. um, because we've had to. Um, and so I use that. And the one new thing, this is a, a mom hack that I've started for any moms that do a side hustle or work at mm-hmm. night, um, is, and I actually um, learned about this from another mom who's a creator, is I have an hourglass. I, I, and it's, it, I, and it came in on Amazon a couple of weeks ago. And my husband's okay. like, why like don't you get this? A uh, legitimate 60-minute okay. hourglass. And, and I said, that hourglass is my writing time. I'm going to pull it out. It's got 60 minutes on it. I'm going to write for those 60 minutes. And sometimes it's after he's gone to bed. Sometimes it's before. Um, but he knows and I know if that hourglass is turned and if it's the sand's falling, that, that I'm focused. That's my hour. Yeah. Um, and he was like, you, you could have done this on the kitchen timer. I'm like, no, but the hourglass is more romantic. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> and, Better and than it, like Alexa. <laughs> Alexa. Yes, exactly. Timer. And it just feels... It, it feels softer. It feels, um, I just like how it feels because I look at it and I see it doesn't feel any pressure um, yeah. going behind the hourglass. Um, and so I watch that hourglass and I write for an hour. And if what I'm writing is terrible, then I stop after that hour um, and I move on and I close the computer. And if what I'm writing is good, then I will stop after that hour. I'll hang out with my husband. If and when he goes to bed earlier than I do, then I might go back to it for another hour or another 30 minutes just to kind of dig into it while I'm feeling creative but yeah. that hourglass has been a nice indicator to both him and me of like it's only an hour that's all I'm asking for yeah and um, you can see the time going by so. yes and it yeah. keeps me accountable to that hour too so if I look over and it's gone I was like I'm you know I'm cognizant of saying okay it's time to close the computer now I've done enough for tonight yep. um and I need to move on and there's a quote um as kind of the tiredness as, as you might feel some nights when you are working on a podcast after having worked a long day and then come home and give it a hundred percent to your kids. Um, and there's a quote about being tired that I always try to remind myself of. It says, you often feel tired, not because you've done too much, but because you've done too little of what sparks a light in you. Mm. Um, and mm. I know as somebody who loves my work, but even more so I love spending time with my family and love spending time with our child but also just loves writing. I yeah. love writing um, that I have to feed that part of my soul yeah. um, because it makes me a better mother. It makes me a better wife um, because I've, I've been asked to create something, whether it ever gets made or um, like chalk it up or whether it never does. It's kind of a part of what I've been asked to put it into the world. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I identify with that a hundred percent. I mean, when I force myself to go to bed on, you know, late night podcasting nights, my thoughts are just like, I I have a notepad in front of me because Mm -hmm. I'm like, I have to write all this down because I know I need sleep. (laughs) And um, and it's like, I will not function at work tomorrow if I don't go to bed. Um, But my, I'm just thriving in this, like, oh, this, I love this. And I have these ideas. And what about this? And um, I get so energized by it. I lay down in the bed and it's, it might as well be two o'clock in the afternoon, you know? And I'm like, it's it is hard and i'm like you i'm i am a night person and i don't require i mean i can mm-hmm. get by without much sleep relatively speaking and so i'm a night owl and i you know people are like when do you do this and i'm like oh like right now <laughs> Brooke, Brooke can attest it's 10 26 at night and here it we is. are um but like I, I tell people you know i stay up till midnight easily you know every yes. night and um so i'm curious how what like what's your how much sleep do you get uh, I stay up till midnight every okay. night usually, okay. um, and then I wake up around six, six yeah, thirty. That's like so me. six yeah. hours is yeah, about what I need. Too. Now, but similar to you, if I'm having a good writing night um, and I'm in the story, it could be two o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, yeah. oh my goodness, I have got to go to bed. And um, you know, I make it through the next day. It may not be pretty, yep. and it may not be <laughs> my best work, but um, I make it through the next day. But there yeah. are some nights where you just can't let it go. You. you you just have to stay in it because yeah. it's it's there and it's alive and it's just a part of you. I agree. Have you ever felt burned out from it and thought, like, yes, I'm going to, I'm done? Yes. Yeah. There's been many, um, so we've been writing for 10 years and it's, it's an arduous process. The, the industry, now that we actually realize that we probably can become, you know, professional writers and that we have the, the skill set to do so and the, um, 
and we feel like that's where God is leading us, um, mm -hmm. but it, his timing is not our timing. Yeah. Um, it, it feels more pressure, um, and it can be very frustrating. We've gone out to Los Angeles for a lot of meetings. We've met with NBC Universal over some scripts that we've had. We've had some really big level meetings um, about some of the things that we've written, and it always feels like we're this close, and then they fall through, and that's very much the nature of the industry. So one, I've gotten used to that, and two, when it first started to happen, I would feel defeated. I would feel kind of like, why am I doing this? And so every time, it's crazy, every time I get to that point of being burnt out, I would usually let it go. I would stop writing. Uh, I'd start reading again because I can only be in one story at one time. So if, if I'm writing yeah. my own stories, I'm usually not reading a novel because um, I'm in somebody else's story. So I would, I'd start reading again, and I'd start praying, and I'd say, God, if you really want me to do this, let me know, but I'm, I'm letting it go. Like, it's okay. Yeah. I don't need to be a writer. Right. Um, I don't need, you know, I enjoy it when it's working. Um, I get frustrated when it's not. And every single time I've let it go and I've told him I'm done, something has happened. Like we've won a contest mm -hmm. or a person has called us and made a meeting or that thing that we thought was going to come through comes through. Um, and so every single time he's come back and said, nope, yeah. I need you to keep going. Yeah. Um, so it's been 10 years now and we've made a film and the beauty of that is one, it's a, it's a testimony to trust and releasing control and faith and knowing that God is so much bigger than what we could ever dream ourselves. We, I, no way 10 years ago when we first wrote Chalk It Up, but I've ever thought that people in Australia, I, I mailed a DVD, DVD to Australia today. Um, so I, I mean, that. It's just crazy. People in Israel and Turkey and all over the world are watching this movie. I never would have dreamed that. Um, and um, two is just to keep pushing forward if he asks you to do that and to know that whatever he does with it, he'll do with it, right? It might just be that I need to reach you know, these people who realize that they have big dreams that they need to accomplish mm -hmm. um, through telling my story. It may never be the ones that we have that happen, but yeah. we're supposed to keep pushing. Yeah. Oh. And that's, so that's what that's we do. Amazing. I love it. I love it. So uh, what do you feel like is, I mean, I know you said, you know, the, where you feel like you're headed with this. Yes. Would we, well, we want to write our own TV show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. We will have our own TV show one day. It's kind of like, it, it's a matter of fact feeling in my soul that we will have our own TV show one day. I have no idea how. I don't know what age we will be. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what it will. Yeah, you don't know what it is. But, we don't. No, we don't. I don't know how old we'll be. It'll. It might be yeah. ten more years from now. We'll be like, golly, we're old women now, writing our own TV show. <laughs> um, but we will have our own TV show. Um, I just feel like resolutely confident in that. I would love for it to happen tomorrow. Um, it probably won't. God's timing is much. He he kind of puts mm -hmm. us in the waiting room a lot, so we kind of wait in the waiting room. Um, so we're there now and I'm excited to see how and when it all comes to fruition. So I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Does your daughter understand what you do in terms of like some day what? job and, and, and Night side job. gig? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So she knows I help people in my day job and, and that, you know, help people find jobs. Um, but the night gig, I don't think she really understands the concept of, of, writing for television or movies because even I didn't understand that there was really yeah. people behind the scenes doing yeah. that. The neatest thing about this for me as she gets older is that I'll be able to look her in the eyes one day and say, mommy did something that she had no idea how to do. Yeah. Right. And that she never thought that she would able to be able to do, but she prayed, she trusted in God and he made it happen. Yeah. And so when she, whatever her chalk it up is, whatever her movie is in life, um, I don't know what that will be. Mm -hmm. I can look at her and say, you can do this, right? Um, don't doubt our big, big God and yeah. don't doubt his capabilities. Yeah. So I think for me, from a parent and from being a mom, like that's what I'm most excited about this is to be able to share that with her and say, you can do this too. Yeah. Right. And I think that's important for us as mothers is to not let go of who we are mm -hmm. um, and the kind of those pieces of ourselves that have those dreams because they do help our children to understand and see their own dreams and believe that they too can accomplish yeah. them. Yeah. 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 I love that. Well, 
I will be praying for you, Brooke, that, thank you, um, you know, that you all will continue to, to see God's plan and to just follow, um, the path that he has set out for the work that you're doing. And, yeah. um, just, it's just amazing. So, and what an amazing story. I had no idea all of this was behind, um, chalk it up and, yep. uh, oh, just, I love it. So it's fun. Well, yeah. So tell everybody, um, kind of where, where they can find some of your work or, or learn oh, yeah. more about Chalk It Up and um, kind of so, how we can f- wait for more. <laughs> yeah, wait for more. Um, Chalk It Up, it, it ran for two years on Netflix, so it just mm-hmm. expired on Netflix, international, uh, domestic. It's still on Netflix International, so if anybody's in other countries, you probably can still watch it. Um, and uh, we have a website where if you're really, um, you've got a, a son or daughter who's a gymnast and loves gymnastics, you're welcome to um, order a DVD. But um, coming down the line, um, uh, I don't know. We will see. We have a, a pilot that's gotten a lot of attention. It's about um, a female athletic director at a Division One school and her having to navigate the world of male sports and um, this high-level Division One athletics. So that's the one that one day we'd love to make um, because it would be a really neat story to tell. But um, we'll see if God has something else in plan before then. So yeah, there's a awesome. Christmas movie that we're thinking about making, Maddie, once again, um, it's kind of pulling me forward and I'm resisting as she's saying we're making, we have a movie called Christmas on fire about a female firefighter that she wants to self produce. And I just know the process. So we're praying, we're praying over yeah. it. Um, yeah, you've been through it now. <laughs> yeah, I've been through it yeah. now. It's, it's you know, like childbirth. Once you've been through it once, you know what you're walking into. Yep. Right? So. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, thank so you, she's, she's, she's making sure that she wants to make that happen. So if oh. God wants to make it happen, we'll, we'll walk through those doors when they come. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing your story of faith and how motherhood has kind of been woven through all of this. And yes. uh, I think you just have... Um, an incredible story of, of listening to God and looking, look at where it's taking you. So yeah. Um, thank you we, for having me. Yeah. Thanks. This was a lot of fun and we will look forward to a lot more from, from you too. This is wonderful. Isn't Brooke amazing? I hope her story of faith inspires you and be sure to check out her movie, Chalk It Up. If you need anything from me, you can find me online at Influential Motherhood and be sure to let me know what you're learning from the show or enjoying about the show. I hope you'll find a way to influence your work or community for good this week, and I'll see you here next Tuesday. In the meantime, you can listen to other episodes of Influential Motherhood or explore more about the show at www.influentialmotherhood.com. See you next week.